morning. I would like to warmly welcome you to our breakfast dialogue this morning. I'm Christina Boeta, manager of the Centre for Constitutional Rights. And thank you very much for braving our odd rain we're having and our infamous traffic for those who are not from here. Um, we appreciate it very much. So today we are very pri privileged to have experts here who will be unpacking the recommendations made by the report of the Presidential Advisory Panel on Land Reform and Agriculture. And they will be sharing their perspectives on the positives and ne negative aspects of these recommendations. So the question of expropriation of compensation, EWC as we all know, and amending section 25 of our constitution has been dominating our political and social landscapes. And many are waiting to hear what Parliament's, um, Parliament's adult committee, which has been established to initiate and introduce legislation, will be doing. Now, according to a very recent statement by the committee, which was released on Friday, they foreseen um, or are hoping to present a draft by 27 November, and the bill is likely to be published in the Government Gazette on 10 December. So it's an exciting time ahead of us, so, we should all, so we're excited to see what will happen. However, I think it's an opportune time to, for us to take a step back and look at a broader picture of the issues affecting land reform and what suggested models have and what models have been suggested as solutions. So in September 2018, the President appointed an advisory panel on land reform consisting of 10 experts from diverse fields to support the Inter-Ministerial Committee on Land Reform. I think it's important again to, um, to emphasize that this panel was an independent advisory panel. It's very distinct from the process happening in Parliament currently regarding the amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution. So this panel's mandate was to advise the Inter-Ministerial Committee on a range of policy matters relating to land reform, including restitution, redistribution, tenant security, and agriculture support. And its mandate included providing a unified policy perspective on land reform. <coughs> Related to the question of EWC, expropriation on compensation, the panel was specifically mandated to consider under which circumstances the policy will be applied, the procedure where the policy will be applied, institutions to enforce and give effect to the policy, and lastly, the rights of any affected persons, including rights to ju judicial review. So the final report was submitted in May 2019, and it contained various recommendations. These recommendations were grouped in recommendations for immediate action, which involved, for instance, developing a single national portal for all um, land-related information, which could be used as a first step to develop infrastructure to integrate, hold, and maintain all land rights. Secondly, recommendations to refocus land reform policy and recommendations towards a consolidated land reform policy framework. But it was specifically relating to a consideration of EWC. It was a sharp disagreement within the panel itself. The majority of panelists supported EWC and amending the constitution and held that it was one of several targeted land acquisition strategies which may commence under very specific circumstances identified for under for no compensation. So these instances to a large extent reflect those stipulated in the expropriation bill, for instance, abandoned land and land held for speculative purposes. The majority of the panel importantly held that the expropriation bill should be finalized and the bills specifically identify the meaning or clarify the meaning of speculative reasons and abandoned land. So to expand on recommendations made by the panel, we've got today, we've got Dr. Rosie Kingwell, who's a research associate at PLAS, the Institute for Poverty, Land Ag and Agrarian Studies at UWC. So Dr. Kingwell's research focus includes um, evaluating appropriate alternative land administration systems in Africa that promote tenant security and respect for customer systems. We're also delighted to have Annalise Crosby here today. So Annalise is the policy head at of land affairs at AgriSA. Um, I don't think I need to introduce AgriSA. AgriSA is an active stakeholder and providing input on national and um, international policy relating to primary agriculture in South Africa. And finally, we have Mr. Chris Hutton here, who's a project manager at Free Market Foundation. Free Market Foundation, also a huge introduction needed, um, a public benefit organization as well, um, founded in 1975, promoting the rule of law and um, based on liberal principles. Again, this event today would not have been possible without our sponsor, Conrad Adenauer Foundation, 
and um, it's been a very long partnership and I think it's been a very productive partnership as well. In this regard, I would like to call um, Mr. Mr. Christian Enders to say a few words and then we'll be starting with Dr. Kingwell and be followed by uh, Annalise Crosby and Mr. Grissat. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. The full house. It must be sunny. That's how it works. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, thank you very much for being here. It's an exciting topic. Land reform together with ESCOM is probably the most pressing conversation that we're having in South Africa at the moment. Um, I say to people who are visiting, ESCOM is a bit like the timbers holding up the roof. There are lots of different parts to it. They're all smoldering, and we're concerned the roof is going to come down on us. <laughs> Land reform is exactly the opposite. It's the foundation of the house. It's what was laid first, and it's the challenge that we have to make sure that the structure stays up. So it's worth remembering that land reform is a question that's not going to go away because it's something that's contested globally. It's a, a question which is fundamental to our times. It's a question that's related to the point in our history when we gave up on might is right as a way of contesting scarce resources. So quickly on the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. The Conrad Adenauer Foundation was founded in 1955. It's a German political foundation. I often say to people, Conrad Adenauer was something like the Nelson Mandela of Germany, who came in after the Nazi past, was there during the founding of the German constitution, the basic law, and transformed Germany uh, towards the Western Alliance and towards a democratic state. The Conrad Adenauer Foundation is focused on civic education, and in light of that, there were some 125,000 participants at CAS events in Germany per year. So they're quite a large organization in Germany, but they also operate internationally in the topic of international cooperation and, and democracy promotion. The topic of intergenerational rights is something that is, of course, not new to Germans. Um, of course, after the First World War, there was much contestation about uh, land in Europe after the expansion of Germany. And then after the Second World War, and the experience of the Holocaust. It's an ongoing debate that's going on in Germany, going on in Germany as to how justice can be achieved after the horrors that happened. <clears throat> the effect of this in current politics is that the relationship with Israel between the German, sorry, between the German Republic and Israel is very close. And there's been an ongoing effort in Germany. It's one of the main planks of German politics that the past has to not be forgotten, that has to be engaged with and it has to be maintained alive and the narrative has to be correct. So it's something that Germans deal with all the time. Similarly in South Africa, the land reform issue is something which underlies our societal engagement with each other. We have three experts here today who are going to speak about the, the technical aspects of the land reform and expropriation discussion. But I'd like to take you to a slightly different place, which is uh, the point I made earlier about might is right. Politics is the art of competing for scarce resources without violence. And violence is not just an unemotional game. There are a lot of emotions attached to the topic of land in South Africa. And if we purely have the discussion about land and expropriation on a technical basis, I'm afraid to say that we're not going to move very far. And it's an emotional issue in South Africa because it's tied to identity. So people see the land as being linked to their own identity, and it was stolen from certain parts of the population. Other parts of the population hold the land and won't want the land to be stolen from them in turn. And Identity is something which is incredibly complicated. It is something which is self-generated. It is something which is generated intersubjectively between a person and a society, and it's socialized when you're young. And these strands are very difficult to, part, to pull apart. I'd, I'd like to pull, as a last point, across to the field of psychology. And uh, I think for those of you who come to a couple of our events, I often mention marriage, because it's something which is ever present. There was a randomized control study done on how to maintain marriage's continuity. 
and uh, it bore the headline in the newspapers later on, 21 minutes to save your marriage. Marriage is our contested space. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't work out. So we'd like to make it work out more often. What the randomized intervention did was that they had, for a year, they had couples come in and speak about the conflicts that they had. Then the intervention happened. The one set of couples continued as they did, coming in to speak about their conflicts. And the other couples were individually, the two partners were individually challenged to look at their conflicts and to try and envision a different position. Now it's very hard to put yourself in the position of the other person, you know, because if you're arguing with somebody, they're a bloody idiot. That's how it works, especially when you're married to them. And it's hard to put yourself there. So the intervention instead said, okay, imagine yourself as a third party that is neutral and that wants to work in the best interest of both parties. Now try and imagine what barriers you have to accepting the position of this neutral person. And then finally envision what you could do to overcome these barriers that you have to partake in the neutral position. After this exercise, for a number of years afterwards, it turned out that there was a higher agreement between the, the married partners. <laughs> so long story, the short takeaway is, sometimes we need to take a step back from the technical aspects and engage with each other as people and recognize that it's very hard to put yourself into the emotional shoes of another person. But by reaching out appropriately that we can move conversations along and then we can get to a point resolving the aspects from a neutral third party position. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm looking very much forward to this event because it's a debate that I think we need to grasp at the nettle. And thank you very much. We'll see you later. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. I'm really looking forward to the debate. I come from CLASS, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies. Um, and my background has been for about 30 years working mainly in the field, in, in rural areas in the Eastern Cape. Um, I moved to Cape Town in 2014 and am now working in informal settlements and have been really amazed at the crossover between some of the issues between the rural and urban um, settlements. So as the introduction implied, I'm interested in looking at alternative forms of land registration or recordal that fits with those norms in the rural areas, often described as communal, but I think that's quite misleading, um, and in informal settlements, so that we can develop land administration system that um, fits everybody's needs. And for me, that is the most unifying element that you can have in land reform. So just to make some overall um, comments, um, before I get into my land administration, which is my particular area of interest here. Um, so I won't be talking So, so my, I'm not going to come at this from EWC angle or the agriculture angle. I'm not equipped on the agricultural side. I've kept abreast of the debates. I'm familiar with the issues, but it's not my area of expertise. I haven't done research on it. Um, so I'm sticking to what I know and, and the area that I think is a potentially the most potentially uh, sorry most unifying elements in land reform policy. And. I come from the angle of context is everything. We're not in a tabula rasa. We are in South Africa with a very emotional present and a very um, difficult past. And we have to work with the present. We've got to work with what we've got now. Um, so uh, in the field and in my theoretical work, my focus is on historical context it's informed by empirical, detailed empirical work and the impact of historical legacies on the present. 
um, and my values are social inclusion, institutional integration and coherence, and not a one-size-fits-all model when it comes to a loan tenure and loan administration. So that is not saying you can't have a unifying framework. Um, so I just want to remind, I don't want to get too stuck on my overall comments because I'll never get into the land admin part of my talk. But I just want to remind people that the, the advisory panel report is not policy. It was drawn from a certain experts who came from very diverse backgrounds um, to give recommendations. In other words, to get a sense of what type of people are saying on the ground and to feed this into the political realm. So one should not get over anxious that this is the new policy. It's not. It's a set of recommendations. And it's now being fed into the executive and they're mulling over it. And uh, you might know that there was a high level panel, parliamentary panel, a few years ago that came up with voluminous reports, but it sat for two years and it commissioned research. This one did not commission research for six months. It was a quick, quick thing. It drew on the high level panel, but um, the key difference is that it's not just a parliamentary process. It was um, a process that was embedded in the presidency and feeding directly into the political realm. And it has, because it's not been strictly just a parliamentary process, I think it has got more buy-in. It's getting potentially more buy-in from the executive. Um, so let me um, move on. So there have been very many critiques of, of this advisory panel. You just have to scan Google and you'll see how many people have responded. And um, just to, to be, try to be concise, Many criticisms were that it was strong on vision but weak on detail. Now for me, I'm not concerned about that. This was not meant to be a detailed policy. It's not a green paper, it's not a white paper. It's not a legislative reform. I like the fact that it was strong on vision because I think what we've been missing, you know, as, as we heard just now, we need to step back and look at the big picture and I think it did that, I think it achieved the big picture. I don't say it did it entirely perfectly at all. I mean, there are many flaws in the, in the report. But I think the fact that it's strong in vision is a very strong point for me. And I feel that it got that better than the high level panel. I feel the high level panel got, because it was so detailed, it got very caught up in, in you know, um, fragmented elements. And it didn't help to produce this unifying vision. Um, so there were weaknesses in the, are weaknesses in the report. Um, from my vantage point, I thought the, te the part that dealt only with land tenure were quite weak. They were weakly conceptualized um, and sadly did not tie it with the elements of land administration, which I think are very strong. Now land tenure is only as strong as your land administration system. And if you present land tenure, as if it's some separate thing, and it's all just about different forms of tenure, you're going to go down the wrong road. We need to look at the unifying management system. We need to look at the administrative and authority systems that um, control these or regulate these systems. So I, I didn't find the tenure sections filled me with, with joy, um, but nevertheless, what was very exciting for me was the fact that there was strong emphasis on land administration, which I'm going to get to now. The other part that I think is worrying is it did not deal with the immediate post report phase that we're in now. And I'm a bit worried that it's gone into the executive, into, it's been discussed at an interministerial level, apparently they're meeting regularly and are taking it very seriously, but suddenly those of us who took a very active role in, in, in the round tables, including myself for the panel, um, suddenly we just excluded again. And it's a bit concerning that some of the ideas, we don't know how they've been packaged in government. So we want transparency brought back into the process. So some of the strengths, which um, again, refer back to what I was saying earlier, 
um, the vision. I do think that overall it, there was a se good sense of urgency, common purpose, strong vision. On the whole, it was a bona fide report, sensible, pragmatic. There was much more broad agreement than any of us expected because the panel representatives, um, the panelists, from very diverse backgrounds, and we thought they're going to be 10 reports, but there was one main one and one minority one, which I think is a huge achievement. Um, I think there was a devotion to constitutional and judiciable principles, and that we must bear in mind for EWC, it emphasized judiciable principles, and it kept going back to the constitution. And I think with regard to property rights, there was an emphasis throughout on striking a balance. It never veered off from that balance, in my view. And it was respectful of existing property rights and extending property rights. That is a very difficult uh, balance to achieve, but I think it, I think it um, overall did that. Um, and I think there was a reasonable interpretation of, la of land reform for public purposes. Um, so from my, to get now to my issues, um, we were very, very excited that it took on board the um, advocacy we've been involved, we being the network I worked with, um, including a lot of sections and recommendations on land administration. Because this is where you address the property structure. You do not address the property structure through the debate about should you title or shouldn't you title. That is uh, going down in a uh, one-way cul-de-sac. Um, because it's the way you administer rights that unify, and you can develop a unified framework. Um, and we noted that, well, what's in the report for immediate action is recommending a single land information portal. And that will bring all all land-related data into one single portal, and that we felt could be done, or they felt, as well as many of us advised, that it can be done immediately. And, and apparently there are moves to, to move ahead, and that would be the foundation. Land information system is the foundation of land tenure of property rights. And ours is fragmented, disjointed, nobody can get to the bottom of who owns what and where people are, etc. The other enormous strength was its focus on urban land tenure because, you know, most people were now 70% urbanized and um, we, the, the, the idea that land tenure is a rural issue is a misnomer. So um, that is a, a, a huge plus for the, the um, report. So you might say, okay, what is land administration? Now I can't, this would be about, um, couple of hours worth, so I can't get into the detail here, but very, very concisely, land administration is the interconnecting set of threads between all land-related matters. Tenure and land rights is just one component of land administration. So all the components should talk to each other if you want good land governance, and that's what we have been stressing and, the la and this panel report took up very strongly, it got it. So, so land administration includes all the juridical issues around tenure, the legal issues around ownership, um, rights, allocation, boundaries, inheritance, transfers, intergenerational issues, um, succession. Those are what we call the juridical issues. Then all the planning issues have got to talk to those at the moment, it only talks to freehold. It doesn't talk to all the others. So that's spatial planning, land use and environmental management, national planning frameworks, and increasingly it has to now include uh, regulation with regard to the climate crisis. Then there are all the issues, fiscal issues around revenue, taxation, rates, fees, expropriation, valuation. These have to be unified across all land tenure systems not just applicable to the formal, so what is now the, what we call the formal system. Then there are all the enforcement agencies for all of this, and then as base, the land information and data system is the base of the whole thing. So this is just a very, you know, um, 
static kind of representation of the of what a land administration system comprises. It's all the things I've already talked about, but I've just put the land information system as the foundation or the floor, the land administration mechanisms are the pillars, and the property system sits on top. And if you look at the issue, issue of tenure through this prism, you can unify all kinds of tenure rights. One must not forget that you know, in Europe, there are very, very many different forms of tenure, and it is the land administration system that, that helped to unify them. We're not the only, the first and last uh, part of the world that has diverse tenure systems. We do not have to flatten them. You can take them into account if you have a good administrative system. So the analogy for land administration is with a road network. A road network, you can have donkey cars, you can have cars, you can have buses, you can have taxis riding on the road system and they're all interconnected. So that's what we're saying we want to do with the land administration system, is have an administrative infrastructure that can combine and link all these different types of tenures. Now, I can't get into the, I have, in, in this presentation I have actually taken excerpts from the advisory panel, which are very dense. I, I won't read them here, I just want it here for the record. I will just do a, a very skim, skim version. But um, the most of the land for land administration recommendations appear from around page 87 to around page 91, but also scattered throughout the report. And, and this is roughly what um, or in a concise or briefly rather, briefly what it's coming up with. And this is, I'm told, um, I have a colleague, Ruth Hall, Professor Ruth, Ruth Hall, who was on the panel. And she isn't really giving me, um, you know, she hasn't sort of given me the inside story of what's going on particularly. But I gather from her and Dr. Um, Guya McClarkey, who was the chair of the panel, they, they at the moment engaging with the um, department, a whole lot of in, uh, departments, public works, settlement, human settlements, um, land affairs is, as usual, a bit slow to come to the table. Um, but they're trying. Um, <laughs> but I gather that they, the most, the, the aspect they are really picking up on most excitedly is land administration. So that has caused me to be very sense of positivism and, um, not positivism, to be positive <laughs> um, and optimistic. But one must bear in mind if one's working on land admin, this is a 20 year process. You are not gonna turn a ship around of that size in five years, it's a 20 year. So we were advocating a 20 year vision for a, a land for a land administration system to be reconfigured, or we call it repurposed, to meet the needs of all South Africans. One of the issues that seem, tends to be the one that most people click on is the recommendation for a land records bill, which is in, to start recording land rights that at the moment off register. So the instead of looking at all these different type tenure types. One is just looking at recorded existing rights. It, ta it takes the emphasis off all the different so-called forms. Um, that's where the alternative systems we've been exploring, experiments in other parts of Africa using GPS, um, and there are massive um, in, um, improvements and innovation in terms of recording rights using modern technology. It's a slow process. It's it's difficult, but it's, it's very exciting, it's happening, and I've been doing research in one informal settlement in Cape Town, Mongardisi Park, where there are recording rights using these, these new systems, and yeah, it's a difficult process to integrate with the main system, but it's happening, and it's going to happen more and more. Um, and we are proposing then, because it's a long process, and difficult, not to just jump in at the deep end, but 
to start drawing lessons from pilots and experiments in all different parts of different settlement types all over the country. To have teams working on these new recording systems and seeing what works and what doesn't work, an iterative process. We're not saying just bang, bang, land records act, and then rush in there like with the bulldozer. It's not going to work. This is, this is a delicate, very localized, contextualized process. And it's going to have to happen incrementally, um, gathering evidence from different pilots. And that's what we've been proposing, and that's what the panel endorsed, that approach. Um, ultimately, it, there will be requirements to probably amend the Deeds Registries Act because we don't want the deed system and this system to be sitting like this because then you're back to your dualism. We want them to talk to each other. They must articulate. But that shouldn't happen too quickly. I'm a bit worried that the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform have taken the idea of a land act, said they're going to do a land records act or bill. They said they're going to do a land administration framework, but they've stopped consulting us. So we don't know, it could be a bull in the china shop. So it's terribly, terribly important to keep the consultations um, going. So um, I don't have, um, here I've done the long excerpt of the um, sort of analysis of land administration, which, which is in um, section three of recommendations of the report, which I won't go through now, but it, um, it picked up on, on our analyses that the land administration system at the moment is excessively fragmented and disjointed. And in some contexts, it has totally broken down. And it is being run by civic institutions on the ground. Um, it is utterly localized. And local is local up to a point, but there's a lot of abuse that can happen at local level. Um, so it's, it's, it's absolutely emphasizing the dualistic nature of the institutional framework. And we're saying we can bring it all together. Um, so just very briefly, in the short term, it is saying in the next one or two years, it must, the state must appoint a reference group or technical working group on land administration that draws in people outside of government. Um, to work on this, on, on, on all, all these ideas. And the, it says collaboration with civil society will be critical for planning and rollout. This is the part that we now have to all be concerned about to make sure that this post advisory panel fails, we keep the, the doors open for civil society. Otherwise, we again just have the battering ram. Um, it's taken up the idea that we include a whole chapter on land administration in the forthcoming green paper and white paper, which has been accepted apparently. There's going to be a new green and white paper process on land reform. And one of the chapters will be on land administration, which was sadly lacking in 94 with, with, uh, during our early reforms. Um, land admin was really neglected. Um, and to start setting up the institutional arrangements and new approaches and using new tools. Um, in the medium term, new legislation. So medium term new legislation, not immediately. And institutions based on, on a lot of research and, and the pilots. And developing a 20 year vision for land administration. And, and we are recommending having, and the panel endorsed it, is having a, um, Land Administration Framework Act. And in that Framework Act, you draw all these threads together. Um, and again, that's a medium to long term, not an immediate goal, but it is what you're actually ultimately uh, leading towards. And that Land Administration Framework Act will be the unifying element of all the components of, of land reform. Um, and the, the, the advisory panel came up with this suggestion, which I think is a good one, for restructuring the departments. And it's saying having a land and agrarian reform agency, not department, an agency that articulates with all the other departments, all the land reform issues, whether it's from whatever department. And then keeping, going 
back to a Department of Land Affairs that deals with land policy, land administration, the Surveyor General's Office and the Beads Registry and geomatics. That goes into land affairs. Um, and then you will have, the rest is pretty much, you know, not that new. You have the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, a Commission on Restitution, which we have, and the Land and Agriculture of it. And the, the, I would endorse those, um, that institutional framework. Um, just going back to a land affairs that deals with the um, land policy and land management and land administration matters, which includes the deeds registry and this record or system. So just to summarize, I think there's enough in this report to bring together contending parties in dialogue, provided government consults civil society and does not forge ahead on its own. Civil society played a major role in providing expert research-based advice to the panel, on a often on a voluntary basis, um, and often self-funding, um, and should now be left in the dark. Um, and I feel that the panel respected um, and was open to new conceptions. It did listen to some new ideas. Um, and it, it, did, it did try and grapple with some of the difficulties and problems. It didn't try and um, duck them. Um, but ultimately, will government trust civil society to partner it in this reconstruction um, and, re and repurposing? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Annelise Crosby. I work for Agri SA. Um, I've been privileged to have been part of this land debate now for more than 20 years from the, f the perspective of the farmers of this country. Um, and I say it's a privilege, which it is, but in a sense, um, it's not always a good thing because one tends to become a bit skeptical over time. And let me just say this, um, starting out before I, I get into the detail of the recommendations and, and the positives and negatives as far as that is concerned, um, that speaking from the more than 20 years experience, um, panels are a good thing, commissions are a good thing, dialogue is necessary when it comes to this very emotive issue that, that you spoke about of land reform. But the number one problem that is not getting addressed and without which none of these intractable problems will ever be solved is effective implementation. And if you read the high-level panel report, the, the 100 pages on land reform carefully, um, that is what they point to. They, they say in that high-level report, which unfortunately has, has not received the, intention, the, the attention that it, that it should have gotten. Because as far as I'm concerned, that is the most authoritative report that has ever been produced on land reform in this country. Um, but what that report found is the problem is not the Constitution. It is not Section 25 and the fact that it requires compensation to be paid upon expropriation. But it is a lack of implementation, lack of capacity, um, insufficient budget, and corruption. So those are the things that need to be addressed. And we can have as many talk shops and reports as we want, um, and as I say, that is a good thing, but unless we address those things, we're not going to go anywhere. And we've come to the conclusion that government cannot do this on their own. 
And if you look at the recent court judgments, the courts are now starting to intervene, like in the Muelazi judgment, where a special master has now been appointed to actually oversee the Department of, of Agriculture, Rural Development and Land Reform to make sure that they implement their own legislation because they haven't been doing that. And I think that, that context is just important when we look at this report. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the status, the panel status and process, the main recommendations, the alternative report by Dan Creek and um, Nick Safontine, um, AgriSA's reaction to the report, and then the latest developments and the, the way forward. So this particular panel, as Dr. Kimo also said, you know, it's very diverse people from very diverse background who um, were nominated to sit on this panel. They actually had a very short period of time with the, in which to come up with their report, and they had a mammoth task to look at the whole spectrum um, of, of land reform. And given that, you know, I, I think they, they've done well in a lot of respect, and particularly in terms of the urban land reform and the land administration um, systems, they have broken new ground. As far as a lot of the other things are concerned, um, you know, one has heard many of these things before. That, that's one of the things of having been part of this debate for 20 years. Things keep on popping up again and again over time. So, you know, things like a moratorium on evictions, um, land ceilings, all of those things. We've had it in the past and it sort of disappeared for a while and now it's come back into the report again. So there is a lot of that as well. So I think it, that, you know, it was a 10 panel report that was um, appointed initially. Those people were appointed in their personal capaci capacities on the basis of expertise that they had. Um, and only nine members um, actively uh, participated in the, in the panel. Um, Advocate Toibi um, was appointed, um, but I think he attended only one or two meetings. So he, he didn't really participate for the rest of the process. Um, so um, the, the two members who brought out the alternative report are the two farming representatives. You know, they come from the farming uh, um, sector, Dan Creek and Nick Safontine. And they, they, were, they got worried at some stage, you know, that the economic fundamentals were not properly considered in, in this whole debate. Um, and then also they had a, a big problem with the um, recommendation to support expropriation without compensation. So um, let, um, those are some of the reasons why they um, decided to then bring out an alternative report. It's important it's not really a minority report because they it did support, and you'll see from um, the rest of my presentation, there's a lot of things in the main report that they supported. Um, but there are also some critical issues where they did not agree. So the main recommendations, and this is just a summary because it is a very comprehensive report, there was support for the amendment of Section 25 of the Constitution. Um, I'll say a bit about more about that later on. There's a proposal for a new white paper on land reform. And there's support for broad agrarian reform with a greater focus on smallholders, national land reform framework bill, comprehensive tenure reform. Um, now, one of the things there that, that we're concerned about, and I agree with, with Dr. Kingwell, um, title is not the be all and end all, but it is the most secure form um, of, of tenure security that we can have. Uh, so we're concerned about the fact that that is sort of being discarded as an option in, in communal areas. So they, they, you, know, you need a step approach, and it's a, the, the, the report, I think, is positive in that respect, but it's a pity that they decided to sort of reject private ownership in the communal areas. There's a greater focus on urban land reform, which has been lacking for a very long time, and which is critically important, because that really, the, the urban areas, is where the greatest need is um, for land, for housing. And then the departmental reconfiguration, which I think is academic at this point in time, because we've just had this amalgamation of the Department of Agriculture and, and Rural Development. So, um, as I said, the two members who brought out the alternative report, they, they practical hands-on farmers. So their approach, I think, was also quite a practical one. 
So in their report, they said that they fully support orderly, orderly and sustainable land reform. They acknowledge the need to speed up and scale up land reform. They acknowledge the history of this position and they actively participated in most of the meetings of the, of the panel up to a certain stage um, where um, you know, they, they got very worried about some of the recommendations. So the proposals that were supported by all is first of all the fact that the, the report says that it strived for a balance between social justice and human development on the one hand and economic prosperity on the other as well as between rural and urban, and between rectifying past injustices and building a sustainable um, future. Now, whether the report actually achieved that in all respects, I think is questionable. I think the rural-urban one, yes. Um, the two members who brought up the alternative report felt that there wasn't enough emphasis on economic reality. So they probably, you know, it did not achieve what it set out to achieve. Um, there's an acknowledgement of the role of corruption and ineptitude to, uh, and that the role that that played in the failure of land reform um, and there was support generally for the creation of a land register and a database of all state and public land holdings including the work that has been done by the private sector because at the moment we sit with a state land audit and we sit with this land uh, Lampo Veerplot Agri SA ADS audit um, and you don't, you, you don't want that. You want one sort of land database that everybody agrees upon. So um, there's also support for the re release of state land for land reform purposes, production support for new farmers, um, the putting into production of underutilized land and communal land, a social compact for, this, for the agricultural sector, development of beneficiary guidelines, um, implementation of the National Development Plan proposals on land and agricultural development, establishment of a land reform fund um, and on a public-private partnership basis, the establishment of an agricultural development agency, a land depository, um, selection criteria for the selection of suitable beneficiaries. Okay, and this is um, also that this builds on, on the previous slide, there's also support for the idea of area-based planning, that you basically have to go down to the lowest level and, and do your planning there, and for the development of an urban land reform policy. There were also recommendations around um, the establishment of conflict and dispute resolution structures at local level. Now, once again, this is nothing new. It's been tried before. It has actually been tried successfully in parts of the country. But the capacity and the funding for this does not exist to do it effectively. And it's critical. You, you can um, solve a lot of disputes if you intervene timelessly and you have experienced mediators. But we, we don't have a, the resources available for that. Proposals to strengthen the Restitution Commission were generally supported. Um, yeah. And so, so the, the proposals that the alternative report focused um, a lot on in detail. Some of them are also sort of mentioned in the main report, but not unpacked to the extent that it was done in the um, alternative report, where the proposals around a land depository, a land reform fund, joint ventures, um, former support, there was a, they've gone into a lot of detail there, um, enablers or incentives for private sector partners and farmers to get involved in land reform, the social compact and beneficiary selection. Now the areas where there was no consensus um, was first of all the one around expropriation without compensation and coupled with that the um, support for the amendment of section 25 of the constitution. There's a, there's a, there's a strange argument being made um, in the report around section 25 um, basically a, a stance that says Section 25 is compensation based and that is a Western legal concept that we should not really be um, you know, using in the African situation and therefore it needs to be amended. Now that, that's a very strange argument because first of all, yes, you know, the origins of our law is Roman Dutch law but that has been adapted over time 
um, and can it's it's a you know it's an evolving system. It's not stagnant. Um, and secondly, um, if you look at international law, expropriation and compensation are inextricably linked. You cannot separate the two. To say expropriation is compensation based, yes, it is, but that it's it's internationally and not only in the Western world. So that's kind of a weird argument. There was also a proposal for a moratorium on, a moratorium on evictions, and the, the report acknowledges that within the current um, wording of Section 25, that would be unconstitutional. So therefore, it is suggested that um, we must look into an amendment, another amendment of Section 25, to enable a moratorium on evictions. Now, that is also quite, quite problematic, and you know, a whole discussion on its own. Um, as I say, the, the two farmers felt that there was insufficient focus on the economic realities. There's a proposal for an investigation into a land tax. Now, we had the Cats Commission, I think they sat for five or six years, a couple of years back, looking into a land tax. Um, and, and eventually they decided against it. Now it seems we're going to have that whole debate over again. Um, you know, farmers are already struggling to survive financially. They cannot afford a, a land tax on top of all the other um, you know, um, property rates and stuff that they're already paying. Um, the whole debate of title deeds versus state ownership of land was also a, a matter that there was no agree agreement on. Then there's a suggestion for a hard and fast compensation policy or formula, um, which Dan Crick and, and Nick Safontein were against. It's something that Agri is, a, is also against. We don't believe that it is actually possible or wise to have a fixed framework for compensation because every single case will be different. And the, the kind of considerations that you have to take into account when coming to just an equitable compensation will vary from one case to, the no to another. And ultimately, if there's no agreement on compensation, the courts will have to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. So we're not, and we're seeing the problems coming to the fore now with the value general trying to apply a specific compensation formula. Um, that is something that, that is problematic. And then also suggestions for an administrative de determination of compensation versus adjudication by the courts. We think it is the role of the courts and it should remain the, the role of the courts. Okay, this I've already spoken about. I'm not going to, um, except for one of the gaps that was identified is that um, Dan Crick and them also thought that there was insufficient focus on best practice models. So if, if you want to know what's going to work in future, the best way to do that is to look at what has worked in the past and what is working at present. And those models are available. Some of them were showcased at the Villa Bella Land Summit last year. And um, you know that is something that the report does not go into in sufficient detail. So just briefly, because it's the, the points of variance um, correspond to a large extent with, with what the alternative report um, also rejected, but Agri-SA is not in favour of the amendment of 10, Section 25 of the Constitution. We don't think there's any legal basis for it. We don't think it's necessary. Um, we think it will have negative unintended economic consequences. We're already seeing some of those negative consequences. Um, it is clearly being done for political reasons, which we don't think is a good reason to tamper with a fundamental right in, in the Constitution. Also, the moratorium on farm evictions, amending the Constitution to enable that is something that we're against. Um, and then there's also a suggestion that the 1913 cutoff date for restitution in the Constitution must be re-looked. Compensation policy I've spoken about, that is something that we reject. Um, there seems, and this is not, the, the report is not explicit on this, but, but there seems to be um, a suggestion that there could be forced on farm settlements where people are residing on farms, people such as labor tenants and farm dwellers, where there will be um, you know, a recordal of the rights to start out with, but that will eventually, eventually be used to expropriate the land without compensation. And, and that can also have all sorts of unintended consequences. 
spoken about the um, stance against the private titling um, in communal areas, the land tax, land ceilings, where you're capping how much um, a particular landowner may, how much land they may have. That's a debate that we've had before um, that's now again coming to the front. And then um, the proposal that land redistribution should be identified at a municipal level um, based on land needs, which is fine. Um, that the current landowner will then be given an opportunity to donate the land and enter into um, negotiation with the um, state or the municipality, but there seems to be a veiled threat of expropriation there to say, you know, you'll be given a chance to donate, but if you don't, there may be expropriation and it may be without compensation, uh, which is something that we also worried about. This whole thing about water allocation reform, um, which is also a debate on, on its own, and then once again suggestions around the regulation of foreign ownership of land, which is also a very complex thing. Well, we still don't know how much land is actually foreign owned, how much agricultural land is foreign owned, um, and what the impacts will be of, of starting to try and regulate that. Okay, um, recommendations that the Black USA supports, um, measures must be taken to curb corruption, corruption the land audit, um, the a land reform fund, the beneficiary selection, the strengthening of the restitution commission, um, the development of outcome indicators for successful land reform monitoring and evaluation. Is there a typo there? No, no, it's okay. We don't have this at the moment. No, no. The monitoring and evaluation that we have currently, you know, is almost non-existent. It's not helping us. And and if you if you don't measure and you don't monitor, you know, you're not going to going to know what's gone wrong. And that's one of the problems that we have is. You know, we implement policies. The policies, for some reason, and the, the, you know, they, they don't seem to work out. They fail. We don't try and find out why they failed and fix them. We just come up with a new policy. So, um, yes, yeah, so, and then the panel recommended a new white paper process. Now, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, the previous white paper dates from 1996. But <laughs> my worry is that. This is going to be another lengthy talk shop. And that whilst we're busy with this, you know, we may not necessarily focus on what we need to focus on, which is implementation and actually making a difference to people's lives on the ground. So we need to be weary of this, of just keeping on debating and coming up with new policies which never get implemented in any event. Um, then the Na National Land Reform Framework Bill. Um, once again, you know, it's, it's a good thing in principle, but the devil may be in the detail, so we'll have to see what exactly is envisaged as far as that is concerned. Um, subdivision of land, yes. Um, subdivision may be warranted in certain circumstances. It may enable, um, you know, certain land reform projects to go ahead, which are difficult at the moment, but you can't just have willy-nilly subdivision. And once again, the, just very briefly, in 1999, the parliament um, repealed the Subdivision of Agricultural Land Act. The president at the time never signed off that repeal act. So it was, it was never actually repealed. So the Department of Agriculture to this day still applies that Subdivision Act. The reason why the president didn't sign the repeal and why it hasn't been um, enforced is because it was said at that stage that we need um, good legislation pr to protect the little high, high um, value agricultural land that we have because we, we only have like 12 percent of arable land in this country the department of agriculture has been trying to come up with that legislation i think for the past 15 years at least there's been drafts published for public comment it's never gone through parliament so we still don't have legislation protecting high-value agricultural land. Um, I don't know why, but we need that before we go um, in, into the whole subdivision thing. Land donations, you know, we, we just want to caution that whilst we think it's a good thing we, when farmers do want to come to the fore and donate land, those who can, um, we don't want to create right, the expectation that this is going to deliver a huge um, amount of land because many family farmers simply are not in a financial position to do this. 
um, water um, reform I've spoken about. Yeah, and then obviously we broadly support the recommendations made in the alternative um, report. So the way forward now, um, in, I, I think the, the report was made public at the end of July. Um, the alternative report was submitted at the same time. There was a presentation made by a panel to the cabinet in early August. And then it was said that government departments are now going to be given two months to study the report and respond. And Dr. King has given some background as to what's happening with the interministerial committee meetings and so on. But we don't know whether and how the public is going to be consulted on this report now. As AgriSA, we've drafted a, a comprehensive response. We don't know who to send it to and by when. <laughs> Um, so, so that, uh, and, and I think you raised it with respect to the um, civil society sector as well. You know, we, we just a bit consider, uh, a bit worried as to how the con consultation is going to go from here. Thank you very much. This, this event. Thank you to, um, to uh, Conrad Adenhauer and to the centre. Thank you very much for the opportunity for me to be here to participate in this discussion. Thank you to my fellow panellists. I hope I can contribute to this in a meaningful way, in a meaningful discussion. Um, I'm coming to this from a philosophical perspective, so I implore the administrators and the lawyers in the room to bring me back down to earth when I get too abstract, um, but we'll see where we go and, and how we go from here. So, for some background, I'm from the Free Market Foundation. We do public advocacy work. Um, so I'm, I'm coming at this from the liberal, classical liberal perspective. Um, that's sort of our view on property rights. So do keep that in mind for, for the discussion going forward. So just on the report, um, I think that the panel was assigned a very daunting task to uh, tackle this issue. We know, we all know about land reform, the land question, how big of a burning issue it is in South Africa, how important it is, it is for South Africa to resolve this um, going forward. So I, uh, as a starting point, I applaud the panel for what they produced. I think it's a very difficult uh, debate to navigate. Um, the, the report itself, I think, is informed by an acknowledgement of the vital importance of our history, of our context, um, our history of injustice, colonialism and apartheid, what has been perpetrated upon black South Africans throughout the history of this country. And I think it's always important to keep that in mind uh, when we have these discussions. Um, the, the matter of spatial legacy, we see the effect of this, um, the effect of apartheid planning of the townships and that sort of thing, how difficult it is for people to get to city centers, into cities to work. Transport costs are rising all the time. Uh, we see the, the difficulty for people to navigate these challenges all the time. And many areas of the country simply cannot develop because they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the acknowledgement of property rights, which other parts of the country do have. Again, that legacy of apartheid where certain areas, certain race groups were allowed strong property rights and other groups were not allowed those strong property rights. And we see the correlation there between the two, I think. A few highlights. Um, oh, sorry, to go back. Um, I think the report did an exceedingly impressive job of cataloging all the challenges facing land reform in the country, all the administration issues, corruption, that sort of thing. And it's to their credit that they acknowledge um, the, the very negative impact of corruption on land reform thus far and how it's been hindered so much um, up to this point. Um, it acknowledges the lack of property rights in the country in certain areas, um, especially rural rural areas around the country. Uh, as the report makes clear, this overwhelmingly affects women and young people. Uh, we know about the disparity um, between men and women, the impact of patriarchy, that sort of concept, that impact on people's lives and how difficult it has been for women in rural areas to use the property that they own to better their own lives, whereas men, this has always been protected for, for those of, of my gender. Um, there's a quote here from the report, the poor capability of the state, which is characterized by deficient coordination, limited and misaligned allocated resources. So this problem that we have a goal that we're heading towards, but resources aren't aligned in one direction. Um, and the problem of lack of resources, I think, 
as politicians tend to tell us and I'll say this broadly so not to attack any specific parties but we are told that land reform and the land question is a pressing issue but then money is spent on things such as failing SOEs and that sort of thing if the land issue is the most pressing issue more money should be allocated to that uh, I think we're all in agreement on that so the report itself um, specifies the conditions under which EWC can happen. I think there's five or six, broadly speaking, um, speculative land, these sorts of things, um, safe land. Um, it accepts the premise of expropriation without compensation. So that's, again, me coming from a philosophical perspective. Mm -hmm. The idea that the state should be at the center of deciding who owns what. So once we amend section 25 of the constitution, this allows the state to dictate who can own what, who may live where, who may not live where, who may um, build businesses where, where they may not. I think once we accept this premise in the constitution, we head down that, that slope. We, we are heading in that direction. This, this amendment itself might not allow that sort of thing, but I think once we accept this premise, we're heading in that direction. Uh, I think accepting EWC, or at least version of different aspects of it, undercuts many excellent points of the report that I mentioned earlier. Um, I feel in some ways that the report maybe tries to play to too many masters and in that way it undercuts itself. Uh, it's trying to hold too many balls in the air and, um, and at the end of the day it drops all of them unfortunately for me from a philosophical and moral perspective. On the philosophical aspects of property rights and EWC, the first one it is each person's right to own his body, his or her body, uh, what he or she does with it, what he or she consumes where he or she lives, who he or she loves, trades with, marries, that sort of thing. That's the sort of underpinning philosophical point from which I'm coming. Uh, it is each person's right to use his or her mind as they see fit, to use their capabilities, their skills, their time, their resources, as they think is best to serve their own lives. I'm sure as we're all aware, we often make the wrong decisions with our time, our investments, our money, that sort of thing. But then we each have to live with the consequences of those actions. That comes with individual responsibility and individual human rights. This extends to the property when we can accumulate, and I want to make the point that we shouldn't just focus on property as land. Property includes all sorts of things, books, cars, laptops, the work we produce, the papers, the research, that sort of thing. And then of course land, farms, houses, uh, that sort of thing. Everything we, we put our labor into, and you might find that interesting because I'm adopting their Marxist theory of labor. Uh, what we mix our labor with is what we own. And what we what we should own and what should be protected by the constitution so sort of abstract i guess point can you be secure in yourself in who you are in your personhood if you don't own property can you be secure in what you build in your business uh, if the state can come in at any point and take that property can you really build a future for yourself in this country if you're always under the threat of the state coming and seizing it and this is again not a point on any political party but if you allow this in the constitution, then any party which gains power in the future can come in and take your property if they deem fit. Uh, it's up to their discretion. And I don't think we should ever allow that sort of arbitrary power by any government or any political party. A matter of corruption uh, in South Africa, I don't want to say we like talking about corruption. Every day feels like the headlines focus on corruption, the Zondo Commission, state capture, all these sorts of things. Maybe it's a it's a favorite pastime of ours, like watching rugby or cricket, we like talking about corruption and it's always at the forefront of our mind. Um, but to me, again, the philosophical point was that state capture was in large part due to how big the government is, how far it reaches. When the government's very big, it opens the door to corruption, to the wrong people taking it. The smaller the government is, the easier it is to control it, the less reach it has into your life, the less it can abuse that power. Uh, the powers of government have increased exponentially. Uh, we, we have seen the, the abuses, the human rights abuses perpetrated on black people in South Africa under colonialism and apartheid. And the trend of big government is continuing now. It might be interesting for, for, people, for some people to note that apartheid was a socialist system. It was about big government, the state using its power to favor certain groups over others, to interfere in the economy, uh, that sort of thing, to control outcomes as it saw fit. Arbitrariness in the law, and this is a rule of law point, arbitrariness fertilizes the soil for abuse and corruption. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about the report, I think it tries to play to many masters and fill many, many gaps, but in that way it sort of opens itself up to more abuse because it's trying to be too broad 
trying to increase the government's power way too much over people's lives. Uh, and once you allow something like expropriation without compensation, you increase the possibility that the state can abuse that power over people's lives. Uh, again, EWC increases the reach of the state into every South African's lives. We, uh, we accept the premise that we should focus completely on the government or at least wait for the government to solve our problems for us. I think this is the wrong way to look at the role of government and government action. Then just the rule of law aspect, as I mentioned, the arbitrariness, to keep that in mind. I think for a constitution to be robust and strong as ours, as we wish for ours to be, for it to be enforceable, for it to keep the government in check, uh, we shouldn't allow much arbitrariness into the laws that Parliament um, enacts upon us. So keeping in mind, the more arbitrary a law, um, the less effective it can be enforced and the more it's opened up for abuse. Then a note on populism uh, that's rising all around the world. I'm sure we're all aware of it with Brexit, uh, Donald Trump, you know, certain parts of Eastern Europe. Um, even in South Africa, there are a few political parties who play into this, this rise of emotion amongst people in, in the population, different race groups all around the world, different religious groups who feel that they're being excluded by governments. Um, they've been promised many things by government. They're promised housing, land, uh, water, food, data, take your pick. And then when they don't get these things, um, they rightfully take things into their own hands. You, you keep reinforcing the point to young people and to students that government is here for you, will give you, will give you things, will provide for you. And then when they don't get these things, we all act very surprised and upset when they take matters into their own hands. And I think this is a logical consequence of the government, governments around the world excluding people from economic participation and promising them certain things while excluding them through laws and regulations. On the matter of, of political parties and voting, um, we sort of see this every few years before elections, different political parties, it seems, they don't run on the, on the concept of ideas anymore, on principles, they run on what they can give the populace, what they can give to voters, that one party can give them more than other parties can. Um, and that's simply a case of that party wanting to be in control of the resources of the state. So, when these parties promise certain things, it's always with a caveat that they're going to have to increase state power over people. For them to give you certain things, they're going to have to increase their control over the state. And that leads again to the abuse point. Um, they can wield that power against their opponents, their political opponents, certain people in society, certain scapegoats. We saw this with Jewish people in Nazi Germany. They were the most convenient scapegoat for the Nazis to use to justify their, um, their massive government, their increase in government control. Um, and legislation. I think, and then from the free market and liberal perspective, the best way to hear and address people's real economic concerns and hardships is to cut regulations and barriers to entry. Less government control, not more. A matter from the Free Market Foundation, one of our big projects, the Kaya Lam land reform project. Kaya Lam means my home. Um, this is a project that we do around the country in Gauteng, here in the Western Cape as well. We're looking at expanding into different areas. So this project is based on title deeds, ownership of homes, of self-ownership of, of people's, um, of their households, of uh, what they own. And this is in rural and previously disadvantaged communities where people have never owned the title deeds to their homes, never mind in 1994 the change in government and that these people were promised a lot in terms of restitution, redistribution. Oh, we go in, we do a registry, we work with the deeds registry to see who has title deeds to their homes, and then different companies and businesses sponsor events where we hand over the title deeds to people so that they can finally own the piece of paper that tells them, this is my house, I may do with it as I please. This is based on the work of Fernando de Soto, the idea of unlocking capital uh, when land is sort of lying fallow, when it's not being used, when there's no property rights in place. Uh, no one can unlock that capital, no one can invest in it and use it to better their own lives, no one can use it to trade with other people, to own businesses, to employ people, they can't rent it out, uh, that sort of concept. And once you unlock the capital through title deeds and strong property rights, uh, people are able to use this to better their own lives. Uh, we work all around the country with different municipalities and different political parties, so in this we are apolitical. 
Uh, we try and engage with the municipalities on an equal footing, an objective footing as best as we can to see what challenges face different municipalities. I think those people know best what challenges they face. It ought not be the purview of a bureaucrat in Pretoria or Bloemfontein or Cape Town to tell someone in, in Kaya or someone in Parais what their municipality should focus on, how they should build their houses, how they should build their town. It should be up to the people of that municipality to decide. And when they have the property rights to their houses, they can do so. So on EWC, and I know this has been my focus from the report, um, and again, I thank my fellow panelists for focusing the, dis the discussion more on the other aspects of the report, but just for me, the EWC point. So possible alternatives or other solutions, which I think are, are much better in terms of economic growth, investment. Um, we, we worry so much about South Africa's lack of economic growth in, in the last 15, 20 years, but the causes are clear. Um, it's because of more regulations, lack of clarity around policy, corruption, all of the above. Uh, and when we trend more in this direction, it's almost as though we're giving investors and business people and South Africans fewer reasons to stay here and invest if we pursue EWC. We need to give people more reasons to stay here, not fewer reasons. So possible solutions, um, reinforcing property rights, areas of the country which do not have these, I think rural, rural areas, as I've said before, in strengthening these. This could also include communal rights, communal property, as long as it's clear in that community which person is the responsible party. And I think that should be acknowledged. Um, we shouldn't try and enforce, let's say, strict, if we want to call it strict Western concept of individual property rights on more traditional areas. Acknowledge what works for them and protect that within the constitution. Don't try and simply take it out, run roughshod over it. I think these things should be should be covered. They should talk to each other instead of being at, at loggerheads. Uh, title these, the concept of unlocking wealth. I think that's a good way to, to go forth. I don't think it's a silver bullet. I don't want to make out that uh, Kaya Lam is the solution to all the property problems in the country. Again, it might work in some areas and not in other areas, uh, but I think it's, it's worked well so far. We're seeing a lot of good feedback. Uh, the communities find lots of value in, in both the presentations and then when they actually have the title deed to their home. They, you can see it has a material effect in their lives. Over a span of five years, you see material improvements in people's homes. Again, it's that concept of owning a home as opposed to the people owning a home. When there's communal, when there's, when there's communal ownership of something, the chance that it's gonna be neglected and not improved is much higher. This is of course not always the case, but it simply increases the probability. Freeing up state-owned land. Um, the state owns a massive amount of land in the country. Of course, a lot of it is not agricultural land. You can't actually use it very effectively, unfortunately. But again, if the state is very focused on simply giving people land, which has been the narrative, it hasn't been about quality of land, but quantity of land, then it can free up a lot of the land that it owns. Uh, where communities recognize and honor communal ownership, this must be documented and respected. Two paths for South Africa, broadly speaking more government control and intervention, or more individual agency and responsibility. Um, there are pragmatic steps, and I think pragmatism is very important in South Africa, given our context, our history, our current situation, that we have so many different claims on land and that sort of thing. That being said, I don't think pragmatism should, should ever trump principle. The principle of individual rights and property rights should always be paramount, in my view. Again, giving people more reasons to stay and invest, not to leave. Other countries are competing for our skilled people and uh, when we give them reasons to stay here, to build their futures and to invest, then hopefully they will. You shouldn't discourage people from, from staying in South Africa. And then one last example, Patrice Mutsepe's multi-billion rand fund for black farmers. This is a great example of the private sector coming to the table playing Playing with government, government has, I think to its credit, tried to engage with the private sector, has said, please come to the table, work with us, engage with us. As has been made clear now, it, is, it seems with the report that they're sort of, maybe they're pushing people away again, and we'll see what happens with that, but at least with Patrice Mutsepe, from his perspective, he's taking agency into his own hands, and he's trying to see how he can help, um, help poor black farmers. I don't think we should fall for the perception that I think is created in large part in the media and on social media that 
black and white people in South Africa are always at each other's throats. I don't think that is the case on the ground. That's not my lived experience, which is again not to say it's not other people's lived experience. But I think many people want to, the overwhelming majority of people in South Africa want to build a country for all of us. And they want to work together. It's not a case of one race group versus another. And the state, you know, the state plays a good game of trying to play different groups against each other, which keeps the attention off of itself. And I'll finish with a quote from my favorite writer and philosopher, Ayn Rand. No human rights can exist without property rights. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to our speakers. I will ask them all to come and sit in the front as we open up the floor for questions. I will also ask that when you ask your question, that you be concise, so, so we can allow for as many uh, rounds of questioning to take place. Okay. Okay. Alright, so I'll take a round of three questions at a time. So you can just raise your hand and use a rubbing mic to come around and you can ask your questions of panelists. Um, Good morning, I'm Kismaya Nodia from an organization called uh, Publication of Women's Empowerment Resources. Um, thank you, Raisa, when you came on. It's so nice to see you. Oh, I forgot the other speaker's name. I'm sorry, from Hydrangea. Um, I'm just interested when you do have dialogues, who do you include that has no political? Do you include people in the you know, community leaders in the townships um, to compile these reports or um, these recommendations? I'm just interested because we all know that if we are politically aligned to any party, um, that is centered to uh, comments and discussions. So I'm just interested, um, who are the civil society organizations, women's organizations, etc., that are included? Finance, fought with public works, fought with defense, fought with Kota, and 20 years later we still have the mess and the issue of, of, uh, of land. Is it now time to revisit the question of redistributing those redundant military bases um, uh, instead of expropriation of productive land? Mm -hmm. Can I address the, the question to you, Chris? Are afraid. 
questions from the rest of the panel? solve this problem is if we work all, to, all work together. So we need civil society, we need the private sector and government to, to work together. We can't do so in silos. Um, and um, Happy Issa is, is also completely apolitical. We, we work very hard to keep party politics out of the, the organization. But really, um, you know, what, what is required is an active citizen, citizenry. And Organizations and individuals need to come forward. I mean, the opportunities are there. It's not always easy, but whenever um, a policy or a piece of legislation gets published for public comment, anybody, even individuals, do have the opportunity to comment in writing and even to ask for an opportunity to come to parliament and address the relevant parliamentary committees on the issue. And, and we, I think we need more people to do that, particularly on, on an issue such as this one. Um, you can't keep the emotion out of it completely. So
tell you, you know, it, the, it, it needs to be facts and evidence based. Um, and we, we don't have enough research. I know PLOS is doing a lot, but we actually, we don't have nearly enough um, evidence based research in this country to, to be able to have that informed debate. But the emotion also needs to be dealt with somewhere. Um, and then just lastly, the question really went to Chris on the on the state owned land, but that certainly is low hanging fruit. I mean, um, and the, the state land audit that was done is flawed. So once again, that's where you need to start. You need to have the facts of what really is available, is not occupied, and for what purpose it can be used. And then that, that should be made available. Yeah, on that matter of the military bases as a specific example, I, if someone asks why, I say why not um, sell it off to a property developer or someone, oh, I'm not a property developer so I can't tell you what they might use it for, but if it's sort of standing there open, not being used for anything, maybe use the material for something else, I don't see why it ought not be. Maybe the government is a bit jittery about someone invading us, I don't know, we know the Russians were here last week, so <laughs> we need to be careful. Um, but I, I don't see why not, why why there shouldn't be a bigger focus on, on selling state-owned land or giving it away, why even have a price on it, um, why just focus on the profit motive the whole time. Um, on that matter of, of engaging with with the wider community, not just farmers, politicians, that sort of thing, I think that's vital to keep in mind. Uh, we all come to this debate, to this table with our own biases, our own upbringing, our own background, and there might be things we're very much unaware of. Which we need, which only other people can tell us about. They can tell us about what what issues face their communities, what emotional ties they have with the land, um, what how they would resolve their what they see to be their challenges. We might think their challenges are things that they simply don't see as an issue. Um, so it's up to us, and I think very much to politicians to engage with the people who they claim to represent. Um, we're supposed to have constitutional democracy, and that doesn't mean much if we don't engage with the people who these things that will affect the most. Okay. Um, I'll just ask one question before I give the question back to the floor. Um, I think Ms. Porter um, mentioned at the beginning that um, Parliament has indicated, and Health Committee has indicated that they will be gazetting, gazetting the legislation um, in, I think, early December. And from my understanding, then the common period will open and will close end of January. Do you think that opening the comment period over a time when most people will be on holiday, government will be shut down, do you think that is a, a bit of a slight on the part of, of the ad hoc committee? Do, do you think that the amount of time that we've been given to perhaps comment on the possible changes is sufficient? Um, a lot of public participation, we know how important public participation is in our democratic project. And why do you think that it's such a short period such a contested, controversial piece of legislation. So I don't know if anybody would like to answer that question, but um, you can answer it after I take in a few more questions from the floor. Um, Daniela here in front, Paul and Mr. Shear. Uh, good morning, Daniela Erbeck from Freedom of Religion South Africa. Um, just two things that you know, I've been thinking about um, as each of you were talking is, firstly, you seem to, in the young students who are interacting on campus and stuff, there's this underlying acceptance that the state will sort out every problem we give to it. So I guess this would be more for the free market foundation, but what can we do to change the minds of the average person in South Africa that actually it's not the state's problem and the state hasn't been able to sort out any problems in the country. So if we give it more things to do, it's unlikely it will do that. Well. Um, and then the second question is, um, I remember reading the high level panel report when it came out. Um, it also stood out to me that the problem is not willingness um, you know, for land reclamation, it's corruption and, um, and the fact that the state is completely ineffective um, with it. <laughs> and I agree with you that I think the private sector needs to take this over because it's never gonna work if the government does it. Um, were there any solutions in this new um, panel report for tackling what the actual problem is, which is the fact that the state hasn't done anything about this? Um, I remember, um, I think it was earlier in the year you guys had a similar discussion on this, or last year, and one of the things that stood out for me from that discussion was the fact 
at the stage it seems to be accumulating more and more land when it does um, when it does do land reform and it doesn't actually pass over title deeds or ownership of the land to people, which for me is just again increasing socialism, increasing the power of the regional state. So I don't know if those are actual questions. Um, there might be points for comment on. property rights are guaranteed in section 35 of the constitution, but that there is an overlap between the two because the right to property is regarded as an element of the rule of law, uh, uh, internationally so, even by Ayn Rand, as uh, Chris has reminded us, and that accordingly, if parliament wants to mess with the rule of law, it has to comply with section 74 means that the idea of expropriation without compensation can only fly in Parliament if 75% of those in the National Assembly vote in favour. Uh, accountability now told Parliament about this in February of last year. We have yet to have a response to our input, but um, presumably that response will come when the Constitutional Court is seized with the issue in due course. In the meantime, we have a, a lot of well-meaning people seeking real-life solutions to the problem, and uh, it, it is a problem. I think uh, if, if I can latch on to the, the previous uh, Daniela's uh, question, I'm not sure, uh, uh, tie along the side, I'm not sure that there are too many shining examples of land reform that has actually worked. I'd like to know if there are some in turn if I don't slip my wrists later in the morning. <laughs> the the uh, Solms Delta example was very fancy with trusts here and bodies there and fancy wine elsewhere. Uh, form fell flat on its face because it was not economically sustainable. Uh, my colleague Alan Nelson gave part of his farm to his farm workers and had came to him and said, we can't do this, sir. And so the, the, the land that belongs to them is lying fallow when in fact it is uh, animal productive land in part. Uh, again, Rosalie, please help us. Is there not some, desire, some, some aspect of land reform that has actually worked? Dave Stewart from the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. I think it's very important to get some idea of the scale involved. One of the great things about South Africa is that there are seven and a half million black households that own their own homes. The value of these homes is at least a trillion rand. That is four times the value of all of the agricultural land in the country. So my question is, don't we need enabling legislation to cut through all of the red tape, to ensure that title deeds can be granted to these homeowners quickly and without any delay? Secondly, 45% of the high potential agricultural land in the country is in the old homeland. Now, this whole question of communal ownership of land, has anybody ever asked those people farming that land whether they prefer communal ownership or whether they want title deeds to that land? Because that land produces very little food. Okay, we'll just come back to the panel and then we'll try and squeeze in another round of questions. So on the first question about um, educating and engaging with the students, that's the eternal challenge and the eternal question, how do you uh, 
convey the classical liberal message to younger people who are in an environment and a context of where Marxism, socialism is the predominant ideology. That's simply the case at universities where you think it's right or wrong. Um, I think it's just a matter of continuing to speak to different audiences, engaging with different student groups. You never know where someone might pick up something that you say, where they take to heart a point that you might have made, even when you're speaking to a very um, antagonistic audience. There might be one or two people who hear a point that you've made um, that they take to heart. I think it's important to also make the, the matter clear that these aren't just, um, that classical liberalism isn't just a Western thing. I think human rights are universal. Uh, property rights are universal, individual rights are universal. It's not just the case for, it ought not to be just for white straight men. Um, everyone, everyone ought to be able to own their property, to live their lives as they see fit to make their own decisions for themselves. Um, and I think it's important to always to keep reinforcing that sort of abstract message. Um, on the, the rule of law aspect, I wanted to ask a technical point of, of Paul and my colleague Martin van Staden would know better, so I should have asked him. He's the lawyer at the FMF, or at least that's his expertise, but is it the two, is it 75% or is it a two thirds majority? to worry too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. <laughs> and then on the last point about cutting through the legislation to enable title deeds to, to be transferred much faster, I, I'm, of course, very much in agreement with that. I, I think the, the legal sort of, not department of the FMF, but the people there are doing a lot of work in this regard to see what legislation is in place at the moment and how we can cut through that, how we can um, how we can sort of sort through what's, what can be amended and what can't and how we can then do sort of chi alum on a countrywide level. Um, sort of take that model, not that it might work across the country, but take that sort of concept to the wider country. Yeah, so on your question regarding the period for public consultation, um, we are definitely worried about the fact, and this, um, it's a bit confusing as to what the um, ad hoc committee are actually saying because they sort of saying we want to publish it so that the National House of Traditional Leaders will have sufficient time over December to consider it and then be a public awareness campaign. And, but then they, they're also talking about public hearings on the wording taking place in the middle of February already. So yes, that is, I, I absolutely agree and I, I think, you know, all the organizations here that have a stake in this matter should probably raise their voices around the fact that this is now happening over Christmas when it's difficult for organizations such as ours to get mandates um, for positions and, and all of that. Um, on the question, Daniela, on corruption and whether the panel report addresses that, it highlights it, but it doesn't really propose, make any concrete proposals as to how to address it. Um, they are a number of forensic investigations that are being done and have been done on particular aspects, um, for example, the strengthening of relative rights, the so-called 50-50 um, pilot projects that Minister Quinty ran, there's a forensic investigation into that. But very often those, the results of those investigations don't get made public. And once again, I think pressure should be put by, by the opposition parties, the media and the public at large so that we know the, what the extent of the corruption is. And I think, you know, we'll all be shocked when, when we get to know what the actual extent of it is. And only then can you really start addressing it. But it is a huge problem. Um, Paul, I certainly hope you write. <laughs> and we have, we've actually submitted the article that we wrote on that to our senior legal team. We have two senior advocates 
um, that are advising us on our strategy um, on, on the whole Section 25 process. Um, and, and it would be wonderful if, if that were the case. There are arguments to the contrary, um, and I think it might, to some extent, depend on the actual wording that they, that they come up with. But, but certainly it would be great if, if that were the case. But even if we're talking about two thirds majority, I think the, the chances of the ANC and the EFF being able to agree on an actual wording is relatively slim because they want very different things when it comes to amending the, um, the Section 25. The examples of land reform, well, that depends a little bit on what your definition of land reform is, whether you're talking about state-driven initiatives or land reform more broadly. You're talking state initiatives with a very, very few success stories. Um, and actually these pilot projects, the 50-50, I mean, the Minister McQuinty made a huge thing about it at some stage. He said there were some 50 farmers who came forward, Psalms Delta being one of them. Um, there was a question in Parliament the other day as to how many of those projects are actually can be considered to have been successful. And it seems there are two from the original 50 that can be regarded as, as, as having been successful. But if you look more broadly at the private sector driven initiatives, the kind of things that were highlighted at Bella Bella, there's another um, land summit um, that will be showcasing the Witzenberg Pulse um, projects that's going to happen on the 14th of November. There have been at least three regional land summits now. There was one last week um, in, in Paul where um, you know, farmers who have been, some with the assistance of land bank, some through private funding, um, that have done projects and have, are now coming forward and telling the world about their projects, there's, there's quite a bit of that happening. But if you want to roll that at, uh, out at scale, you need incentives and you need um, innovative financing models, um, for which we don't have at the moment. Um, and then also, of course, land reform isn't just agriculture. And I think, you know, the, the urban context and the Kaya Lam kind of thing plays into that. There are success stories there as well. Um, yeah, and then just a, a, a remark on the um, agricultural land in the old homelands that Dave Stewart mentioned. I mean, when, when AgriSA did the land order together with Agri Development Solutions and Lampa Weerpla, one of the things that was apparent from that is that, you know, um, if you look at the production potential of agricultural land, then the, the land with the highest uh, agricultural potential is on the eastern seaboard. And a lot of that is where you've got the old homelands area. So is, there is tremendous agricultural potential still locked up in those areas. And we need to find ways of putting that land you know, into production. And AgriSA is working with the Mutsepe Foundation, you know, to try and do exactly that, to stimulate agricultural production in those whole old homeland areas. Um, I would maybe like to address the question that Dave raised about site abuse, because that's something I feel I've heard most about. But um, my colleague in this audience is going to kill me.
lessons, yes, I, I, I was responsible for driving land distribution from 1905 to this effect uh, in 2004. I left before the first of land acquisition strategy came on board. I was surprised that I was going to do that. <laughs> uh, not because I'm a free marketeer, uh, but because of just what works and what doesn't work. And I think that there's, there's a lot of history here where, wherever the state in South Africa has owned land, there's been corruption, there's been patronage, and, and that, that goes back a long way. And it's not a new phenomenon, sadly. Okay. Um, on the success stories, though, look, the problem, is, which was alluded to earlier, is that we haven't had proper monitoring, proper evaluation. We don't have the empirical information to say categorically, this is what's worked, this is what percentages have worked, and what hasn't worked. Um, there, there's, 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 there's a lot of suggestions that some things have worked well, that some things haven't, have, haven't worked. There are success stories out there. We haven't highlighted them. There's a, currently a, a very useful project Ownership, we are not talking about title. Okay, we're talking about very different things. Um, Professor, the late Professor Alison Kerr, an acknowledged expert on, on, on just and new law, would have told you quite categorically that in so called communal areas, people own their land, they have ownership. Okay, the point is, and this is Rosalind's point, is it's not recognized, it's not publicly recorded, and therefore you can't bully the banks into actually supporting you know, that, that as per the land law. So, our problem is an administrative problem. Not necessarily a tenure problem. Okay, it's how we administer, how we record, and how we give some legal recognition to what rights exist. Okay, kind of lump, great. If people want title deeds, that's fantastic. But the problem we have is that there is a market in land, in urban land, in urban housing, but it happens off register. Okay, and because of transaction costs and because of a whole lot of socioeconomic conditions, and really until we have a simplified public recording system and simplified and cheaper transfer system, we will continue to have that. And significantly, the old permission to occupy system in the form of Bunchestan areas, if you look at those records when they were administered, those records were extremely up-to-date, well-kept, because it was cheap, it was local. You know, so so there's, there's plenty of history again to, to, to look back to about land administration, what has worked in the past. In terms of productivity in, in, in the form of Bunchestan areas, trust land areas, not communal areas, because people have very clear individual family and collective rights, uh, community level, level rights. The, the, the National Wool Growers Association has been in sterling work for the last, for the last 20 years, okay, um, improving the wool flip uh, across Cisco, Transco, uh, Southern, Southern state. Um, simple inter interventions. Um, uh, interesting, and, and, and so, so, so the wool clip, the quality of the wool clip, percentage prices of, of, of the national price, as people have moved from 20% of the national price to, to 80% of the national price in the southern communal areas. Okay. So it's not about tenure per se, okay. okay. It's about land use, it's about all sorts of other things. Significantly, Association has also been surveying these areas and asking, what would you like? Okay. 
And access to title land is not one of the top priorities. Okay, more land here. Um, moving, there's a small percentage of people, I mean, assuming that these, these surveys are accurate, there's a small percentage of people, say 12% of the successful emergent wool growers who would like to move, okay? Um, but the majority are actually quite happy where they are with appropriate support services, okay? So again, we've got to look very carefully at what's happening Just, just the last point around, around productivity in, 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 in former budget zone areas. Uh, the wool is one example of a, a successful intervention, but cattle sales, uh, my own work over the last, last, last few, few, few years, cattle sales in the Trans Sky alone are worth between five and 10 billion a year. So I'm going to close the questions now. The speakers are available after the summer but perhaps dash off, but you're more than welcome to approach them after we close proceedings formally. I think this conversation has definitely shown light on the fact that the conversation about property is bigger than just about title or about physical land. It's about understanding property in the broad form that the Constitution envisions it to be understood. It's about support from both government and civil society as and where we can provide it. I'm going to hand over to Ms. Botha to close for us, and then you're more than welcome to network after this. Thank you all. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our dialogue today. I'm sure you all will agree that it's been a very informative discussion, and I want to personally thank all of our speakers for making the time to share your views today. And um, it seems like we can have a whole seminar just on title deeds. And that was exactly what we wanted to do today. We wanted, we are specifically speakers from very sp different fields and viewpoints as well and opposing con um, principles. I mean, we've got free market foundations and we've got Dr. Kimmel specifically writing on the title deeds might not be the solution in all cases. So we wanted to hear these different perspectives. And what I found very positive today is that there's been definitely a consensus uh, between the panelists that a specific report from the panel was, to a large extent, positive. There's been positive measures, but you need to have a long-term approach, firstly. That's specifically our last speaker. Um, we will definitely invite you, eventually, <laughs> as a panelist. Um, a definitely a large-term um, viewpoint. There is not a, you don't have immediate, but you need effective implementation of um, measures already possible. So I think there's a lot of positive aspects. And what, is, what, I, what I also picked up from today is we want to engage and we want to find solutions. And even if we have very very different ideas to what could work. So thank you so much again and thank you all for making your time.